Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremy. Um, and to, to, uh, and to, today, together with my co-host, Dr. Go Ping Ping, uh, AHVC would like to welcome everyone uh, to spend their afternoon here with us. Uh, for those who have joined us yesterday, this is our second part, uh, part two of our webinar, our virtual guide to cardiac disease, which is our ASM team this year. Uh, for those people who have uh, only joined us today, uh, thank you very much for spending this Sunday afternoon with us. So today we will we'll have uh, two sessions. One is uh, talking about structural heart disease uh, by Dr. Agate, and then the other one in the next hour will be by our other colleague, Dr. Chan Wan Xian. So today I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Agate. Uh, I think Edgar doesn't really require much introduction because most of you will know him. He's my senior in medical school and uh, he's also a senior consultant as well as a structural heart disease uh, program director at the National University Hospital Cardiac Center. Uh, we're actually very grateful that he's actually uh, taking time off uh, on his private Sunday afternoon, Sunday afternoon to, to join us in today's session. Um, as you all know, Edgar uh, has, uh, is an interventional cardiologist, but he did his HMDP training uh, both in Royal Brompton Hospital uh, for structural heart disease, including congenital heart and pulmonary hypertension, and then subsequently also in Vancouver St. Paul's Hospital doing uh, this TAVI program, which is the trans uh, aortic, um, uh, aortic valve uh, intervention. So I think without further ado, today we're, we're very, very thankful that Edgar is going to share with us on very simple, but also very interesting management of common murmurs that you will hear in your clinic. So without further ado, Ega, please uh, share with us your experience. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, once again, thank you very much for um, coming in this afternoon to uh, listen to our talks. So I'll share my screen here. Okay, before I start, I just want to um, run a quick uh, poll. Um, let's try this. Okay, so um, we have two questions for the um, for you guys. Um, the first question is, uh, auscultation using the stethoscope is uh, no longer relevant in current practice as we have quite advanced imaging uh, capabilities like uh, portable echocardiograms. So I'd like you to look at these questions and then um, let me know whether you agree or disagree. Uh, the second question is uh, a little bit more general question. Have you heard about this term called structural heart disease? Um, and uh, we'll give you maybe another 10 seconds to see what you guys think. And then we'll end the poll. <clears throat> Okay, so end the poll here. <clears throat> so I can see that uh, the majority of people still feel that a stethoscope has some relevance. So uh, there's a reason for me to give this talk. And hopefully I'll also convince the 16% uh, um, uh, of uh, participants who feel that auscultation is no longer relevant. Um, second thing is uh, about structural heart disease. Well, a lot of you uh, have heard about this and so I'll just share a little bit more about what this actually is in the next uh, few slides. Okay, good. So we'll go to the talk now. <clears throat> okay, so um, why we are interested in management of cardiac murmurs is because um, for a long time, uh, traditionally in medical school, we have been taught how to use a status quo in a very early phase of our clinical training. And in those years when we, we many of us started, uh, a lot of times why the status quo is important is because we were picking up a lot of rheumatic uh, valve disease in those days. And that really spurred a lot of interest in cardiac murmurs, sounds of the heart and everything. But uh, then there came to a period where there was a bit of a decline because rheumatic disease became less and less common. 
But now there's again a resurgence of cardiac murmurs. And the reason is because now we have changed completely from a rheumatic heart disease uh, many years ago now to degenerative uh, heart valve disease. And therefore, there's a real recurrence and a re real resurgence in the need to, to be uh, able to uh, pick up these heart uh, murmurs and sounds because it's a totally different uh, uh, sounds nowadays. And uh, it's very important because these patients now have uh, treatment options. So what I, uh, a little brief introduction to what structural heart disease is, uh, what structural heart disease is, uh, and this is really uh, a field that I've, I was interested in and therefore did a lot of training in, was uh, really an uh, encompassing of all the uh, conditions that can affect various components or structures of the heart. Um, it kind of, uh, re removes the coronaries and the electrophysiology. As you know, uh, uh, we have many subspecialties and structural heart disease really these uh, mostly concentrated on valvular uh, heart disease. And therefore you, you understand now why the talk is uh, murmurs, but also it encompasses congenital heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, and some of the uh, interesting uh, uh, things like atrial appendage closure for stroke prevention. So there are a lot of things under structural heart disease uh, which can now be treated uh, percutaneously. And because of this ability to treat them with a less invasive option, there's a lot more interest uh, in the field now. So I'll go straight into this, uh, today's talk, which is really about how to understand uh, and, and kind of revise the sounds that happen in our heart. And remember, the two basic sounds that we need to know is the first and second heart sound, or what we call a lap and dub. And this really uh, is actually a uh, sound that is generated by the clapping of the uh, valve. So like the mitral valve claps and when it's closed and then the aortic valve claps when it closes and you get two clapping sounds and typically or traditionally we call them the lub dub sound. So lub for S1, first heart sound and dub for S2. And of course, if you want to know uh, why these valves close is because the pressures uh, between the two chambers change are resulting in a natural physics phenomenon where the valves, first the mitral will close and then followed by the aortic valve. So this is what a standard uh, first and second heart sound will, will sound like. Very simple, but very important because this is what we need to start off as a baseline. And you can see it's, it's essentially a clapping of the mitral valve and the aortic valve that generates the lap dub sound. So this is how we can correlate uh, physiology, anatomy and sound. The second concept we want to talk about is the development of murmurs. So essentially, there is a continuous state of blood flow in our cardiovascular system. And uh, most of the time, uh, the flow is what we call laminar flow, where the flow is very, very uh, streamlined and there isn't much resistance. And therefore, that actually generates almost no sound at all. That's perfect uh, uh, situation where there's no resistance. But once there is obstruction or uh, say a short circuit or a hole in the heart, for example, then there becomes uh, problems with flow turbulence, uh, what we call uh, flow currents. And here you can see um, the middle one is when a valve opens nicely, you have laminar flow or very uh, streamlined flow, you don't have murmurs. But if you have a stenotic valve but the valve does not want to open, you're squeezing it through a little small orifice, you generate this, uh, this eddy currents or this uh, turbulence and therefore that generates the a loud uh, murmur uh, that we typically, typically can hear uh, with, with the stethoscope. For many patients you auscultate, you will realize there are two main types uh, of murmurs and you may remember this uh, in medical school. And physiology, uh, physiological or innocent murmurs are common, yes, but they are more typically found in younger adolescent uh, and children uh, rather than adults. Uh, of course, there is also the um, things like the memory souffle where you hear during uh, pregnancy. But remember in adulthood, or especially in older patients, most murmurs that you hear oftentimes have some pathological abnormalities with the valve. So it's important to therefore understand um, how to uh, diagnose these murmurs. And one of the most important steps is of course timing. Timing these murmurs to see whether they're in systolic phase or they're in the diastolic phase. So how do we do this? Uh, very simply, remember, we have to just palpate the uh, carotid arteries at the same time when we auscultate the heart. And the uh, uh, carotid upstroke or the pulse on the carotid pulse will then correlate with the uh, um, S1 and then you know which is the first and second heart sound. So if you see um, 
Um, systolic murmurs will therefore run between first uh, and second heart sound, and diastolic murmurs will run after the second heart sound. So just by using the carotid upstroke, you can tell whether it's a systolic or diastolic murmur. And this will be an example of a rough ejection systolic murmur that comes between the first and second heart sound. And this other side, you will hear a soft, pearly diastolic murmur. The second thing to think about is um, we've been taught about specific locations to put our stethoscope to auscultate. So it's um, in the past, they didn't really explain to us exactly why we have to put it in these spots. But if you look at it nowadays, if you do a CT scan, this is a coronal uh, plane where we cut the patients through the top to the, to the toes. And you can see the um, aorta here, the mitral valve, aortic valve, the right atrium, the tricuspid valve, and the pulmonary valve. And that actually correlates if you if you put all the if you put this uh, overlay on, you can see that there is where the aortic valve is loudest, where the pulmonary sounds are loudest, where the tricuspid sounds are loudest, left sternal edge, where the mitral valve uh, at the apex is loudest. And in aortic stenosis, of course, you have radiation upwards to the carotids. And also around the uh, uh, infraclavicular regions, you can hear sometimes continuous murmur. So the positions really correlate to the anatomy, and therefore this is easy to understand now why we have to put these uh, markers of, of where we put our stethoscope to get the best sound uh, quality in these patients. So to, to kind of put the whole picture together, we really need to find out why we want to do this. And really, I think the aim is to, uh, to do this. So number one is we if we auscultate and we hear a murmur, we come up with a differential diagnosis. We will confirm it with um, imaging, usually with a transthoracic echocardiogram, and then we come to manage the patient. So it's very simply auscultate, image, and manage. And this is really the, the basics of structural heart disease where you can pick up the murmur. And therefore, as, um, as primary care uh, or even uh, uh, students or even physicians, when we, when we kind of re re revise these uh, techniques, it's increasingly more important for us to understand that auscultation is now becoming more important uh, in this day and age. So we start with a simple uh, murmur first. Uh, this is aortic stenosis. As you know, aortic stenosis is really the uh, situation where the valves become calcified and narrowed. And on the right side, you see a picture where the aortic valve is very, very thickened. And the blue arrows showing that as the, as the flow of blood travels through the left ventricle to the aorta, you get these eddy currents. And therefore, if you put your stethoscope at that region, at the lower left sternal edge, or you put it in the aortic region, you're going to hear a loud murmur. If the valve stenosis is severe enough, the uh, turbulence can be generated all the way up to the carotid arteries. And therefore, you can even auscultate that murmur uh, present in the carotid arteries. And therefore, you call that radiation. So it's a simple uh, concept of how we can uh, put our anatomy, physiology, and the auscultation skills together. So remember, this is what aortic stenosis looks like. In a mild situation, it's still pliable and it opens quite well. So you might hear a very soft um, systolic murmur, but as it becomes more calcified and ragged, uh, you will then realize that um, a lot of force is required to open these valves, and therefore it generates a much louder uh, and more prominent murmur. But if this severity gets even worse till the point that some patients come only with a pin, pinpoint hole of aortic stenosis, it can be so severe that so little blood is coming out that sometimes the murmur paradoxic, paradoxically becomes even softer. So um, murmur quality changes uh, correlates with progression of disease. So it could go with ma uh, soft murmurs, louder murmurs, and then finally can even become soft again. So it's important to understand the stage of the disease uh, may not be so easily clarified just with auscultation. So you still need imaging to confirm this. So remember to revise again, um, the ejection systolic murmur of aortic stenosis will come between the first and second heart sounds and it's typically described as a crescendo de crescendo murmur, meaning it goes up and down. And therefore, if you hear this murmur, let's hear that again. So this is a very rough coarse murmur that goes uh, louder, reach the peak, and then it decelerates. So you get this uh, up and down kind of 
very grainy, coarse uh, sounding murmur between first and second heart sounds. And here is what, we, what happens if so a patient gets picked up with severe aortic stenosis clinically or there's an ejection systolic murmur, the next step is imaging. So imaging requires a trans thoracic echocardiogram. And here is a typical case where a physician has picked up an ejection systolic murmur and sent the patient for a trans thoracic echo. And here you can see the left ventricle is contracting well, uh, but the aortic valve in the center is very calcified and very restricted. And this is the aorta. And therefore, you can imagine once blood is trying to be squeezing through the LV to the AO, there will be generation of a loud ejection systolic murmur. Sometimes, if the murmurs, uh, uh, if the valve is, is, is tight, you can also hear what is called a seagull murmur, which I'll play for you right now. So this can be heard uh, again in the aortic region, and it is typical of cause of very uh, significant aortic stenosis. So remember, aim, so auscultate, picking up the differentials of injection systolic murmur, in this case, aortic stenosis, imaging to confirm the stenosis, and therefore, subsequently, the patient can then undergo treatment. So for aortic stenosis, there's really uh, now uh, multiple options. In the past, we were relegated only to aortic valve replacement or surgery. But nowadays, we have the option of uh, percutaneous uh, treatment. And therefore, in many situations nowadays, in the elderly patients especially, those who used to fear open heart surgery, there is some other options for treatment. So um, this is an important disease to pick up. So I'll just show you a video of how this uh, valve works. So essentially, um, this is a, a catheter that goes from the femoral arteries, uh, goes into the ascending aorta, just like how a coronary angiogram uh, catheter travels. And you see this device called the uh, valve is mounted on a balloon, just like a stent. And this is positioned right at the level of the stenosed aortic valve, which is not opening well. And in a couple of seconds, you'll see um, expansion of the balloon. The balloon expands the valve. And the, the stand actually holds the old native uh, leaflets open, allowing the new leaflets to start to function in the center. So this is something that is used more and more commonly nowadays, these days, uh, to help some of these patients with uh, severe aortic stenosis. The next murmur we're gonna talk about is uh, another systolic murmur. We call this the pan-systolic murmur, and it's another one of these classic murmurs that we need to hear. This is the typical murmur of mitral valve uh, regurgitation. Very different from uh, aortic stenosis in the sense it's pan-systolic with a single uh, level of uh, tonation, not like the crescendo di crescendo. The intensity is about the same and extends all the way from the first to the second heart sound. And this is what it, what it sounds like. So it's a hollow systolic or uh, continuous, we wouldn't call it continuous, but a, a systolic member that extends all the way from S1 to S2. And again, uh, echocardiogram can confirm the uh, um, findings of the murmur. This is an uh, animation that actually shows what an echo would probably look like, look like in the tree chamber view. So again, auscultate image, and then treat. So I'm going to show you how this valve, uh, mitral valve leakage can be treated. Here you have the ventricle contracting. You see this blue jet is the regurgitation murmur. There's regurgitation going into the left atrium. And this is the system. We call it the mitral clip mitral valve repair system. It has essentially a clip at the distal end of the catheter. It's done through a transvenous access, means through the femoral veins. And we put this catheter into the right atrium and we do what is called a transeptal puncture, which goes through the uh, left atrium. And then this catheter is then placed into the left atrial cavity. Once the, sh the, the guide is placed there, you can then put in the uh, mitral clip. The mitral clip is now currently closed. So you see it uh, almost like a kind of an oblong rectangular structure. And it's, it's flexible and it's uh, kind of controlled out of the patient's uh, uh, body. And it allows a variety of flexion and uh, extension motions, medial and lateral uh, movements. And it can be opened, uh, uh, its wings can be opened. And here you're seeing the valve from the atrial end. You, see, you can see then quickly the, the blue jet of blood is regurgitating back into the left atrium. So seeing uh, 
the valve then allows us to put this uh, clip down and try to bring the two leaflets of the uh, mitral valve together. And by doing so, it should be able to reduce uh, the leaking. So you see, once the, the clip is placed on, the, uh, the blue jet uh, is reduced. And of course, if you're not happy with the uh, regurgitation reduction, you can reattempt it. Uh, you can clip it again and try to get a result that has no uh, more significant uh, mitral regurgitation. And you convert the patient to have a, what we call a double orifice mitral valve, which is a typical situation uh, in some congenital heart disease that, that are still compatible and, and still have normal uh, lifespan. So this is really mimicking what is known as the Alfieri stitch in surgical practice. And after we're happy with the results, the clip can be deployed and the rest of the delivery cables can be removed from the patient. And now you're left, left essentially with a clip that will endothelize over a period of about six months. So the, the real uh, pictures obviously will not look so uh, much like an animation, but it is quite close though. So this is the three-dimensional echocardiogram that we utilize nowadays to see the clip, as well as the mitral valve in a real life patient. This is actually us doing the procedure. You can see what happened in this particular case is that the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet of this mitral valve are, are supposed to form a smile, meaning that it's supposed to touch each other. But here you see a very big gap on the picture on the top left. And then the mitral clip is now being advanced in from the, from the atrial side, going into the ventricle. And on the bottom left picture, you can see that the clip arms are now open, allowing the anterior and the posterior mitral leaflet to get caught uh, and get rested on the, on the clip arms before the clip is finally closed. And here you can see the clip then catches both the anterior and the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And you can then re reduce the regurgitation and develop what is known as the double outlet, uh, uh, double orifice mitral valve, like what you saw in the animation. So you, the current imaging capabilities is as good as the animation that you've seen. And here you can see that the amount of regurgitation is now reduced significantly. So we're gonna swing track now. We've heard about the uh, um, ejection systolic murmur of aortic stenosis and the pan systolic murmur of mitral regurgitation. And now we're gonna go uh, to uh, a, a, a kind of a diastolic murmur, uh, which is now a murmur that happens after the second heart sound. And here is really the murmur of uh, mitral stenosis. Here mitral stenosis is the rheumatic form where you have the uh, stenosis occurring at the commissures so if you remember in pathology, they used to call this the fish mouth uh, opening of the, of the mitral valve because the valve is now uh, opening just like the, the, the mouth of a fish uh, because the commissures are now uh, very much fused. And the murmur sounds very much like this. So it typically happens after you hit a first a second heart sound, and then you have what is called mid diastolic rumble. And that is typical of mitral stenosis. It's best heard with the uh, bell in the mitral position. And you can accentuate this with uh, lying the patient in the left lateral position. So remember, um, auscultate, image, and manage. So imaging is important here. If you look at this picture, you can see that the mitral valve, the anterior and posterior leaflet are almost like glued to each other and they are not opening well. And this is uh, typical of severe mitral stenosis. And a three-dimensional echo will show you what a real fish, hole, a fish mouth uh, stenosis looks like. And that's where you can see and confirm the, uh, the path pathology by what you saw earlier on. And here, it typically shows you how the left atrial flow into the ventricle is now disrupted. And you can see this very yellow uh, looking flow. This is a marker of turbulence and therefore it generates the, the rumble or the mid diastolic rumble. So this is turbulence that I spoke to you about generated by the stenotic valve, therefore creates this sound that is loud and therefore you can pick up this mid diastolic rumble. So what do we do about these uh, valves? Uh, we bring them to the lab and we use something called a balloon to perform stretching of the valve, or we call it a uh, balloon valvuloplasty. So this is an in a way balloon that we would put into the left ventricle and 
uh, you see a tiny waist in this balloon. And that's where the restriction of the valve is. And with multiple inflations, we actually will stretch, open this valve, improve blood flow. This again is an image on the top right showing uh, that we use nowadays three-dimensional echocardiograms to see uh, where the valve is. And on the right bottom image, you are seeing the balloon expansion and it's really forcing the uh, anterior and posterior leaflets to, to splay apart to, to kind of open a little bit more. Okay, we have, sp we have spoken quite a bit about um, acquired uh, heart disease uh, generating murmurs or heart uh, sounds, abnormal heart sounds. Now we want to also think a little bit about congenital heart disease because that's the other group of patients that you will pick up significant murmurs and it's important to, to deal with them. And we'll go uh, through the uh, most common types of murmurs that you can hear when a patient has significant congenital heart disease. So the first uh, we're going to talk about is the atrial septal uh, defect or what we call the ASDs. Um, there are obviously multiple types of ASDs um, and they can be classified whether they are secundum or primum ASDs or very rare sinus venosus ASDs or even coronary sinus VS, uh, ASDs. So there are multiple types, but the most common is still the secundum atrial septal defect type uh, that you will pick up sometimes in your practice. And I would say that a lot of adults, when they come to us to uh, primary care, most of them are picked up uh, fairly incidentally. Uh, one is by auscultating and uh, they see a, a primary care physician picked up a murmur or even some uh, picked up a split second heart sound. Uh, the other common way of picking up these patients are oftentimes during uh, evaluation for employment, for employment, like a chest x-ray showing cardiomegaly or uh, a screen of an ECG that shows an incomplete bundle branch block. So there are multiple ways these patients end up uh, seeing us. But it's important to understand that this um, ASD will generate a sound in the heart. And generally, it generates two sounds. One is a ejection systolic murmur, and it also has a what we call a fixed split of the second heart sound. So if you hear, you should hear a ejection systolic murmur and a fixed split of the second heart sound. So let's listen to that. So why is this murmur generated? Uh, it's simply because now you look at the left atrium, look at the picture on the left, the left atrium on the top, the right atrium on the bottom, and the wall that separates the left atrium and the uh, right atrium now is defective. You can see a gap in the uh, in, in where I'm pointing at. And in the um, three-dimensional echo view, you can see a hole. And that's where the ASD is. And if you allow uh, a color Doppler to be put in, you can actually see on imaging that there is a continuous uh, a flow that comes from the left atrium to the right atrium, and that will generate this murmur of uh, flow that you can hear. It actually is not at this level that the flow is most well heard. It's actually a level of the, of the pulmonary uh, flow that is accentuated once this uh, um, ASD is there. So why is it important, again, to um, auscultate and then image and then uh, manage? Is because these patients can be relatively uh, well managed uh, by um, transcatheter, if not possible, then by surgery. I would say the majority of secundum atrial septal defects, if they were uh, not too large, they can be treated percutaneously. And this re uh, really involves us putting a catheter across the, um, the, the gap that you've seen and deploying this clamshell type uh, uh, atrial septal closure device that you see on the right uh, through the femoral vein. Um, so here's a picture of what it looks like. Um, once we open the disc, uh, it's a very large uh, uh, disc that opens on the left atrium and is pulled then towards the uh, septum. And then you can see the other um, a disc will open. So what it looks like in three-dimensional um, echo is you can see this round a disc now filling up where the hole originally was. And if you put in color Doppler, you will see that there's no more flow uh, and there will be no more murmur that you can hear. The next defect, uh, also pretty common, is a ventricular septal defect. Again, many, many types, um, muscular, perimembranous, outlet VSD, inlet VSD. Mus uh, these are all variety of uh, murmurs that you can, that would even though, I mean, there are multiple types of VSDs, but they more or less generate the same kind of sound, which is essentially a pan-systolic murmur uh, 
again, similar to that of um, um, mitral regurgitation. And why is it important? Once you pick this up, you need to echo the patient, image the patient. And here you can see that if you do a echocardiogram, you can see a, a color jet in the middle of this picture. And if we do an angiogram with a pigtail catheter that is put into the left ventricle, we inject contrast, you can see jets of uh, contrast swirling from the left side to the right side. And this is typical of flow across a ventricular septal defect. Once we diagnose this uh, condition, um, there are a variety of ways to treat them. Um, surgery is quite common for uh, younger patients. Uh, in some patients, we have attempted a percutaneous closure by putting in a plug. And this plug really sits in the space between the left and right ventricle and therefore seals the, the jet, uh, not allowing the uh, uh, flow to occur anymore. And here you can see uh, we use also echocardiogram to guide us uh, where the catheter and the sheath is now placed across the defect from the uh, right side to the left. And here is us delivering a plug and you can see that now the, the flow from the left does not communicate to the right anymore. And here in the center, you can see the plug and the plug is now fully released. This is what it looks like in the end uh, on and geography. You can see the plug is released and here is echocardiogram confirming that there is no longer any flow or communication between the left ventricle on, on this side and the right ventricle on this other end. Okay, the final um, murmur I want to talk about is uh, a little bit less common, but it's uh, interesting because you might hear this once in a while. Um, this is the murmur of patent uh, ductus arteriosus or PDA. And we call it a machinery or a continuous murmur. And it sounds a little bit like this. So it's, it's very rough course and it's, it, it traverses the entire um, um, cardiac cycle from systole to diastole and you hear a, a kind of a continuous, very rough machine-like like murmur. And this is best heard over the, just below the uh, left-sided clavicle. And why is it important? Again, it's important to first confirm it with uh, echocardiogram by imaging it. So you can see that this uh, color jet is, is, is present. And if we go on then to confirm it with angiography, here what we have done is we have put in a pigtail catheter from the aortic, uh, uh, from the femoral artery going to the aorta, where the AO is. And as contrast is being injected, you can see a little stream of of um, contrast trying to make its way from the left, which is the aorta, into the pulmonary artery where the other catheter is, is there. And so this allows us to confirm that the patient truly has a per, uh, persistent or patent ductus arteriosus. So what can be done? Well, percutaneous therapies can be offered if the patient has a size that's suitable for this. And here we put in a plugs that look a little bit like the pictures that you see at the bottom of the screen. These plugs serve to occlude or block up that connection between the uh, aorta and the pulmonary artery. And it's oftentimes we oversize these plugs, which are very flexible. They, they act a little bit like springs and they have polyester fabric in them. And what happens is once the plug is released, uh, no further flow can communicate between uh, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And one of the common uh, indications or the reasons why we close these um, um, holes, the PDA, is very much dependent on auscultation. So if we hear a continuous murmur, then oftentimes we would recommend that the patient should have this um, a defect closed because it can increase the, the patient's risk of developing endocarditis. Therefore, it shows how important uh, auscultation is, not just for diagnosis, but even for prognostication and treatment as well. Okay, so we have come to the uh, um, a conclusion. So remember, I think auscultation is truly very important. Um, it really acts as the first step. If the, if the murmur is picked up, then it allows the patient then to transit to image, uh, which is oftentimes done non-invasively with a transthoracic echocardiogram. And then finally, a co-management between the primary care and the cardiologist would then be set in place. Because even if the murmur was there and uh, say the, the valve disease was not significant,
it does not mean that the patient is then uh, just left alone because these patients still need to, to continue to have some form of follow-up subsequently. So I'll just say that the structural heart disease field has been growing quite rapidly because there is more options of treatment now for patients that are less invasive. And therefore it opens up a whole uh, new uh, uh, opportunity for, for program development between uh, primary care and cardiology and the patient. Therefore, this is uh, very exciting times. And nowadays, uh, we, we often form heart teams within the uh, uh, cardiology group practices as well. Um, because there's a need now, not just for isolated uh, skill sets, but multidisciplinary expertise is required. And then we can tailor the best form of treatment for these patients. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Edgar, for this uh, very interesting talk, uh, very uh, superbly illustrated, I think both uh, audio as well as the video and uh, for introducing to the participants this whole spectrum of structural heart disease and the uh, uh, new possibilities of treatment. Uh, we have some questions uh, that have come in. Um, first question, uh, can a younger patient with aortic stenosis actually consider TAVI? Because earlier we said that you know, it's good for those elderly people who are perhaps too high risk for surgery. Yeah, that's a very good question. So. Um, the um, age is um, not the only factor that we look at. So we, we look at a couple of things. So firstly, aortic stenosis uh, treatment we, for, with using TAVI or transcatheter aortic valve uh, replacement, uh, we originally started it, uh, treating a very, very elderly, very sick patients. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. And then gradually as the therapy became uh, safer, we then transited to lower risk individuals. And now the recent studies have been shown that we can even treat uh, low-risk uh, individuals as well. However, what is still not completely uh, certain is the long-term uh, durability of these valves, which are still being followed up over time. And uh, the thing about younger patients is that if you say, it depends on how young the patient, if the patient say, for example, someone who is in their 40s, for example, if you put in a biological valve in this, because cavity valves are biological valves, so when you put a biological valve, there is a certain time span before the valves would deteriorate. So you need to put into your decision making also how long the expected life uh, or longevity of this patient is. So if the patient's longevity is very, very long, some people may choose to say, consider a mechanical heart valve, which, which okay. basically will last longer, but trading off the problems of needing anticoagulation like warfarin. So, it's a very complex uh, decision uh, matrix nowadays, nowadays, but it's really the concept of firstly, firstly surgical risk, how high risk the patient is. Two is the uh, longevity of the patient. And thirdly, nowadays also the patient's wishes because sometimes patients may want biological valves versus uh, uh, mechanical valves. But for the very, very even younger patients, you're looking at patients with congenital bicuspid aortic stenosis who are in their twenties or even younger, uh, sometimes they may be amenable to aortic valvuloplasty still uh, if the valves are pliable at those, at those uh, early uh, stage. So the choice is nowadays uh, very varied and very complex and it takes now long, quite a long time to discuss with them about the options available. Okay, thank you, Aga. Uh, sorry, I think I forgot to mention just now during housekeeping, uh, for anyone in attendees who wants to have any questions, please kindly post it in the Q&A and then we'll look at it and uh, we'll post the questions to Dr. Aga. Okay, Aga, since we are on the topic of uh, anti-coagulation because you mentioned about it for the mechanical valve, so, so for most of this uh, structural heart intervention, on average, will these patients require long-term antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation therapy, say for the mitral clip and for the TAVI? Okay, so for the uh, TAVI, the data is a little bit more uh, well-defined. Um, they have tested a variety of uh, uh, anticoagulants and antiplatelet therapies. And actually, they found that the, the easiest way is just to be on single antiplatelet agent. Uh, they found that uh, warfarin doesn't add any benefit to these patients. And also the NOAX do not add any benefit. And dual antiplatelet also doesn't seem to have any additional benefit. Um, of course, these are trials that run uh, patients up to about two or three years follow-up. Um, but at least for the uh, um, early phase, uh, after we treat the patients, most of the patients with these uh, transcatheter aortic valves, for example, they only need uh, aspirin uh, 
uh, for their valves. Unless they have a secondary indication that is not related to the valve, for example, if they have atrial fibrillation, then they will be on anticoagulants for the purpose of the um, AF. And in those cases, then if the patient is on anticoagulants, then they don't need to be on an uh, antiplatelet. Just so basically, it simplifies the, uh, the therapy for these patients. But for mitroclip, um, again, the data is a little bit less uh, or lacking, and most of us would treat the patients with uh, anti, a dual antiplatelet for about three to six months, and then lifelong aspirin if they were in sinus rhythm. Um, but if they have atrial fibrillation, then they are just on uh, anticoagulants for the uh, AF indication. Uh, they do not need any additional uh, treatment for that. So again, pretty uh, uh, simplified uh, kind of regimens for the patients. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So actually, do we know uh, uh, how uh, how old, uh, who is the longest uh, patient post-TAVI in Singapore, for example? Um, in our center, is uh, uh, currently uh, the oldest patient where we treated is 91 years old. Um, and the patient's uh, next year, I think, is the 100th birthday wow. oh, next year. So we're waiting for her to come back next year to have a hopefully a celebration with her. Uh, but she's still doing quite well. So I must say that um, these patients are self-selected in a way. Mm -hmm. In fact, the patients, there are a lot of patients that come and see us for Tavi. They're actually the patients who have actually did well enough not to get uh, other chronic diseases like heart attacks. They don't get heart failure. They don't get uh, strokes. They don't have kidney problems. So they actually are patients who are very in a way, they, they ran the marathon. They, they, they did so well um, that they had time to degenerate uh, their valves. And therefore, when we actually bring them in to do what we call pre-procedure uh, ass assessment, sometimes we do an angiogram, you'll really be surprised that they have completely pristine coronary arteries, clean coronary, just like a young patient. It's amazing. And uh, these patients, I think, are self-selected. So they, they are, uh, in a way, uh, we. That's why we don't use age to be a barrier for cutoff, but really the biological age of the patient. Let's, but of course, we have conversely patients who don't look after themselves so well. And, and in a situation, if say they develop chronic diseases like heart attacks and they become very high risk, they also can be offered TAVI at a younger age. Okay, I, got, I think there's a question here about uh, mitral clip. So uh, someone asked whether mitral clip is really as good as mitral valve uh, replacement. And I think on the same note, I also like to ask if a patient has got significant mitral uh, valve prolapse with uh, one of those mixometers degenerative valve, uh, if that patient is not keen for surgery or suitable for surgery in severe MR, are, are they also candidates for a uh, mitral clip? Okay, so there are two... Uh, questions. The first question is about the clinical selection criteria. I mean, like who? Uh, okay, so first question is why? Uh, wh when should we do surgery for the patient? And when should we do uh, uh, percutaneous treatment for the patient? So, um, to understand, to understand actually, if you think about the mitral valve as uh, as two potential pathologies, one is what we call the functional mitral regurgitation. That one is a little bit clearer because we have got relatively good uh, data. These are patients with uh, typical heart failure and they have relatively normal functioning valve leaflets, but the valves are pulled away because they have a dilated ventricle like heart failure and they develop severe mitral regurgitation. Those cases, uh, mitral clip has a clear uh, advantage uh, over medical therapy alone. Um, and, and at this present time, because of the strength of the evidence, it kind of favors uh, mitral clip in that cohort of patients, what we call the functional mitral regurgitation patients. Mm -hmm. In the more classic uh, uh, degenerative type of mitral valve disease where the patients have, say, prolapse, uh, tissue, uh, abnormal soft tissue of the, of the heart valves or, or torn leaflets, um, these cases, if the patients can benefit from surgery, surgery oftentimes is still the best uh, first choice because the surgeons can repair these uh, valves to almost perfection in, in, in good cases. Um, and we usually do uh, reserve the mitral clip in these patients where the patient's surgical risk is very high, where the surgeons um, uh, feel that opening up the chest or putting the patients through a bypass uh, at that point in time is too, too difficult, too high risk for the patient, then they usually will ask us to consider mitral clip. Why? The reason is because while the mitral clip can reduce regurgitation in these patients, it will not be as perfect as surgery because surgery, the, the, the patient's heart is, is uh, temporarily uh, stopped. 
and there is, is time for the surgeons to actually uh, properly repair these uh, heart valves. So I think in the prolapse uh, situation, we oftentimes need to have a surgeon to tell us uh, what they think is the surgical success first, and then also the risk, and then we can make a conjoint decision about whether to offer surgery as a first choice or to clip as, the, as a backup, or clip sometimes in first choice for high-risk patients. I think uh, a lot of our GP partners also they are probably quite interested in like antibiotic prophylaxis and uh, any uh, advice for these uh, various uh, new devices, uh, new procedures that the patients might go through. Yeah, so there's a very important uh, uh, important uh, uh, step that we have to remind our patients as well after the uh, procedure. Because invariably, these are still uh, considered foreign uh, particles, uh, foreign materials that we put into the patients. So um, for the valves, um, they are similar to what the surgical practice is. So if the patient has a transcatheter heart valve implanted, the patient will get uh, endocarditis prophylaxis, uh, uh, just like what the surgeons do. So this, if so, a mitra, post mitral clip, if the patient needs to go for a dental procedure, definitely an hour before the dental procedure, if the patient's not allergic, they will get two grams of amoxicillin an hour before. Uh, similarly, for those with uh, transcatheter aortic valve implants, uh, or what we call TAVI, uh, again, they will be on uh, antibiotic prophylaxis uh, lifelong. So as long as they have an implant, they will get lifelong uh, endocarditis prophylaxis. In the case of the um, atrial septal defect, say when we close these uh, holes, hole in the hearts, for example, we will have to see whether there's any more uh, um, leaks. In the first six months, definitely all patients need endocarditis prophylaxis. After six months, in the patients have no leaks, then actually they don't need already an antibiotic prophylaxis. But if they still have a small regurgitation or a small leak across the device, then uh, they may still require um, prophylaxis. So usually we will try to remind the patients uh, every time they come and see us that uh, they, they really need to protect their, the valves because uh, it's a very serious uh, situation if the valves get infected uh, because it will become a very uh, oftentimes very difficult to treat kind of endocarditis. So very important uh, question. Yeah. Thank you for that, Dr. Go. Hey, uh, there's a question from a GP here. Uh, so the GP uh, is concerned about uh, one patient that uh, he sometimes will, will pick up you know, those adult ASD who has no history of surgical closure and, uh, and usually they're not on follow up with any uh, heart center. Uh, his question is how to tell whether this patient have gone into s girls when they're clinically asynotic and uh, uh, is there any, anything else we can offer them or should we just send all of them to see you? Okay, so there are some clues. There are some clues. Okay, firstly, to tell from symptoms for uh, what we... So actually, Eisenmenger is uh, a continuum. So the patient starts off with uh, a normal physiology. Then they was, if they have this, this shunt for a long time, they develop what is called Eisenmenger physiology, which is like the middle stage. And then if they, they don't get treated, they go into real Eisenmenger uh, syndrome. And this process can occur over... 10, 15, 20 years, and it's very gradual. And so the first thing you need to know is that you, you, you cannot base it just on uh, symptoms alone because the patients will not feel it uh, because the, the change is so gradual that um, patients will generally over time adapt their activity. So maybe they started off being an athlete in, in younger days and then gradually they became more and more sedentary. And you can hardly tell just by asking, how do you feel? Are you short of breath? They will say no. So firstly, symptomatology is not that uh, useful. So how do you tell? Number one is if the patient is, like you say, if they're clearly blue, then you will be able to tell for sure. <laughs> the second thing is um, you could do what is known as uh, exercise uh, desaturation. If you don't have uh, ability to, to conduct a formal exercise, you can just get a patient to walk, um, say maybe 10 minutes out, out on the, on, the, on the street or something and quickly come back uh, to your clinic uh, and then put a pulse oximeter on. And if you have a desaturation that you see, say from 90, 98 at rest, and then when he walks quickly and comes back to you and it's like 92, then there is some uh, potential that the patient has, has gone into some kind of isomanger physiology. 
And the other trick that I always tell the medical students is do the hemoglobin. Um, if the patient has elevated uh, hemoglobin levels, um, say, uh, say for a, a male, usually it's 13 grams or so, but if some patient comes into 15, 16 grams and then no history of smoking and all that, then that actually gives some clue that patient maybe has intermittent hypoxia and that could be a marker of, of shunting as well. Uh, so that's also a clue. So you can use your exercise uh, and your uh, hemoglobin levels to uh, make a judgment. But in the end, you will probably still to image them and assess their uh, pulmonary pressures to make the, the diagnosis of isomental physiology. So some, there are some tricks, uh, but uh, in the end, we, we oftentimes still have to confirm it with imaging. Mm, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, and I think on the note on structural heart, although this is not a lesion that you can auscultate, uh, what I'm going to ask you about is, is called a PFO, a patent form of ovale. I think most of the time we uh, assume that this is a very benign situation and we, li we leave it alone. But I think recently there's increased awareness in the neurological um, community as well as there's some guidelines to suggest that for young strokes uh, uh, in particular, and there's no other underlying cause, as, especially atrial fibrillation, and you detect a PFO and you actually can demonstrate a transcranial Doppler kind of a bubble, agitated bubble contrast. Uh, currently, is it really a, a good recommendation to uh, close those PFOs? Yeah, very good question. This is again another new uh, uh, fi uh, new kind of information that we just got about about two years ago, uh, where there was uh, suddenly a lot of information coming in from actually the neurology colleagues and the cardiology teams, uh, because they ran three different separate clinical trials uh, in different parts of the world um, on these patients who have what we call cryptogenic uh, stroke, which basically means uh, patients who have had stroke but uh, did not find any clear uh, culprit, meaning their carotids were clean. Uh, they don't have cardiovascular risk factors or stroke risk factors, uh, and typically young patients, and they don't have pro-thrombotic uh, states. So when they uh, diagnosed with cryptogenic stroke, they were then tested to, to receive either just blood thinness or they received a uh, PFO closure, which means putting a device to close this uh, patent foramen ovale. And you know, patent for formal ovale is actually a very common uh, defect. Uh, one quarter of us, that means uh, uh, probably very, I mean, it's, it's extremely common, uh, uh, will have this uh, defect. Um, and therefore, um, it's been shown that in this patient with cryptogenic stroke plus a PFO, uh, if, they, if they find and isolate a PFO, um, closing the device uh, actually reduces the risk of the recurrent stroke. So it is, uh, it is actually found to be more effective than just medications uh, alone. And the reduction in, in the risk uh, for some of these recurrent strokes can be down to almost about 45 to 50%. So uh, it's a very uh, effective uh, uh, risk reduction. It doesn't eliminate the risk completely, but it's a risk uh, reducing uh, therapy. Um, what you need to do, however, is to be sure that the patient is uh, properly evaluated by a neurologist just to make sure that it's truly cryptogenic. And the second thing is, uh, the question is, how can you pick up um, these uh, PFOs? Uh, one way is the transcranial Doppler, like what you said. Uh, but the other way, which is the gold standard, really is a transesophageal echo. Um, and uh, with the transesophageal echo, we inject uh, agitated uh, uh, bubbles. Uh, through the venous excess, and then you can see whether these micro bubbles uh, traverse across from the right to the left side, and we see a large amount of bubbles. Then these patients will be diagnosed with a PFO, and then we can then talk to the patient about uh, the pros and cons of of closing these uh, defects. So, the neurology guidelines have also been updated recently. Uh, the stroke neurologists now have uh, consensus statements to determine the patients that are that will benefit from uh, PFO closure nowadays. Thank you, Edgar. Yeah. Okay, I think we are in good time. Uh, maybe I'll just ask one last question before I ask Dr. Go to uh, maybe close the session. So I think some GPs will also have patients who already previously had mitral valve surgery or uh, aortic valve surgery. Uh, and if they, they, if they had the bioprosthetic valve and their valve are now the deteriorating, is there anything else we can offer them uh, percutaneously or do they need to go for a reopen, redo surgery? Yeah, so uh, there's another piece of good news for some patients who've had um, 
um, bioprosthetic valve uh, dysfunction, um, if they uh, meet certain uh, uh, objective criteria on imaging studies, um, sometimes we can put in the TAVI valves into some of these degenerated uh, prosthesis and what we call resetting the lifespan of the, of the valves uh, in both the mitral as well as the aortic position. Um, but we have to make sure, of course, that the, the sizes of the previous valve is adequate for us to do such a uh, treatment. And of course, the, the risk of that have to be assessed based on uh, CT scans and echocardiograms. Um, but it's also, I think, more, more important is um, it's, it's very important when a patient has been transferred to primary care after uh, bioprosthetic valve surgery, you have to record what those uh, heart sounds sound like when you first see them after a successful valve operation so that when you follow them, you can hear that the valve uh, quality, the murmur quality changes. So all patients with bioprosthesis oftentimes say aortic valve prosthesis will have a soft ejection systolic murmur. That's quite normal. But over time, uh, if you hear that the murmur gets uh, worse, uh, louder, then you must suspect that the patient may have de deterioration and they, they should be imaged uh, with echocardiograms. Uh, or if you hear suddenly a new diastolic murmur, the diastolic murmur is, uh, is, is totally abnormal in a, in a bioprosthetic valve. And so if you hear a diastolic murmur for the, I'm talking about aortic valve, a diastolic murmur, if you hear it, again, they should be uh, imaged as well, because this is the, the way you can pick up the patient's who have a deterioration of the uh, bioprosthesis. Okay, so if there are, I think we are probably, uh, time is uh, uh, coming up. So uh, if there's no further question, I would like to close the session. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Edgar, for sharing uh, this afternoon uh, with us. And uh, personally, I learned this very important synonym, which is uh, AIM, AIM, uh, Auscultate, Image, and Manage. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Aga. And yeah. uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, the, the next session will be at uh, 4 o'clock. So there's a one hour break for everyone who, to stretch around and maybe have some tea time. Unfortunately, we can't provide tea time, but we can look into that next year. If COVID still stays and uh, doesn't allow us to uh, physically interact. Okay, um, I think uh, the, all these sessions will be recorded and uh, at some point we will put them out on our website. So yesterday's sessions as well as today's sessions will be eventually uh, be viewable uh, on, on our website. So thank you very much. Have a good uh, Sunday afternoon. Thanks, Aga. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.